Welcome everybody. We're so glad that you're here today. If you're our guest, we're so thankful that you're here. Uh, welcome to Glad Tidings Assembly of God. My name is Brandon. If you don't know, um, how many are so thankful? How many remember what happened last week? What what, what day was it? Easter. Easter. What do we celebrate on Easter? We celebrate Jesus rising from the dead. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, introduction to hope. So we're going to be looking at hope today. And if you have your Bibles or your, or your Version Bible app, if you could pull up Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And as you are uh, pulling that up, let me give you a little bit of context of, of the, the Scripture so exactly one week before the events of Easter, Jesus and his disciples were ushered into the city of Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, as, they were, as if they were conquering heroes. People were yelling and screaming, and it was a, an electric atmosphere, and people were cutting down palm branches, and they were laying uh, them, uh, carpeting the way for the, the donkey that Jesus was riding on, and some people were taking off their coats and throwing them in front of the donkey, just honoring him and saying, you are so awesome, and they were yelling and cheering, and it was an incredible, awesome event that the people there were just excited. They knew that something was about to happen that was amazing. The children were making up songs about Jesus, and it was just a fun, fun atmosphere. It was electric with anticipation that something great was going to happen. Then if in a few short days after that, Jesus was arrested at night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, the people who had followed him for three years, devoted their lives to they they now um, were running away afraid that they too were going to be arrested and then they watched Jesus whom they had followed and had listened to and had saw him do many miracles they saw him being beaten and mocked and spat upon and scourged and these guys man they loved Jesus what do you think it did to them to see Jesus being tortured and beaten like this it might, must have been like a punch in the gut there was it was an emotional time and so uh, they not only saw him being beaten then condemned to die that he was going to be executed and not just executed but execution by crucifixion the worst kind of execution that the Romans could think up the worst type of to torture so imagine the roller coaster that the disciples are going on. Four days earlier, he, Jesus comes into the city with shouts of joy and exaltation and thoughts of that maybe he was going to be the promised king. And now four days later, he's walking close to that same path, maybe in the exact same path, out of the city, and he is going to be executed. And he, the, cloud, the, the same population probably that said, Hosanna, welcome is he who comes in the name of the Lord, are the same people who said, crucify him, crucify him. What an amazing roller coaster. And just 12 hours before, 18 hours before Jesus had been washing the disciples' feet, now they see spikes driven through Jesus' feet. An incredible emotion that was going on. They saw Jesus tortured, humiliated, and, and then they watched him die. So we find ourselves in Luke chapter 24. This is the background to this. Luke 24, verses 1, we'll be reading down through verse 9. Excuse me. But on the first day of the week, now Jesus had been buried. It's been three days since he's been buried. Now, on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as 
they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Can we say risen? Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. What an amazing thing that has transpired. Here, they... They had just seen Jesus die, and they go to prepare his, his body. But just in a few short days, everything has changed. What a roller coaster. First, the one uh, whom the disciples loved, they saw brutally tortured, executed. Then uh, he was buried, and then after that, his, his body was not where it was supposed to be. I don't know about you, but... I've never seen a dead body move itself. The body, right? The body was not where it's supposed to be. The, the stone was rolled away. Where was Jesus? It's not where's Waldo. It was where's Jesus? Right? So they're looking for Jesus. And so now two supernatural beings get their attention and say, He's not here, He is risen. Now, if you're a disciple, what are you supposed to think? You are just, eight days before you come into Jerusalem, things are just crazy. You think, hey, we're going to take over the world. We're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Jesus is the guy. And then, and then it, Jesus is arrested, and you're in the garden, and there's swords, and Peter's swinging swords around, and, and ears are flying off, and all these things. And then you run away because you don't know if you're going to be arrested with Jesus. And then you, you're in hiding because you don't know if the Romans are going to look after you. And then uh, um, you hear that Jesus has died. And the thing that you never thought could happen has happened. Jesus is dead. And then you're told where he's buried. And then, and then Jesus is buried and people are saying, well, we, we have to wait to do the burial rites because it's the Sabbath and we have to wait. And so they wait. And then on the third day, you go to the, to the tomb. And he's not there. And then a supernatural beings come and say, hey, he's not here. Why are you even here? He said he'd be, he'd be risen. And you're like, what is going on here? I don't know about you, but I have never had that happen to me. Fair enough, right? Never happened to me. And so um, I think it's funny that we make fun of the disciples I don't know if it's me. I would be a little whacked out. Be like, uh, I don't do drugs, but this is just like a trip. I mean, <laughs> this is crazy. This is crazy. And so then they get reports back that uh, they go to the disciples, and um, the other disciples that are there are like, uh, you just must be overcome with grief because this is nuts. This has never happened before. Um, I know Jesus was something special, but what's going on here? And then all of a sudden, as they're gathered together, the remaining 11 people, 11 disciples, Jesus comes in the midst of them. He comes and he shows himself. And he says, I am not a ghost. And he eats fish to prove it. And he says, here, come handle my body. Put your fingers where the nails were. Put them in my hands. Put, put your hand on my side. Put your hands in my feet. And so they dared not even to hope because uh, he, was, he was dead, but now he's here. We have, friends, I want, to, want you to know that we have hope in the resurrection. When hope arise, arrives, everything changes. When hope arrives, it, take, it can even take you by surprise, and it took the disciples by surprise. Hope had arrived, and they didn't know what to do with it. Let's read in verse 44. It says, Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still 
with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer. On the third day, rise from the dead and that, watch this, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Wow, this is hope. That forgiveness could be preached in the name of Jesus, that we could find hope. The hope is, uh, comes from the resurrection. We are forgiven from our sins because Jesus rose again from the dead. That is the message. Friends, Jesus is alive. Jesus is the life. Um, I've been to the, to the gravesite of, of great men. And they're still there. How many have been to the gravesite of, of Abraham Lincoln down in Springfield? Yeah, I have too. He's still there. Lincoln's still there. You know, uh, Buddha is still in his grave. Krishna is still there. Jesus is not in his grave. He is alive. He is risen. And this is our hope. This is the message, Jesus triumphed over death. And friends, it's not a secret. It was not intended to be a secret. See, what Jesus does in our life, it is personal. It's not private. It's not to be kept a secret what Jesus does for us. It's a personal thing. What he does for us, it's not a secret. It's not private. This message was intended to be heard and understood by everyone who would listen. Man, I'm so glad that you listened and that you understood. I'm glad that Jesus changed your life. I'm glad that he did a work in your life like he did a work in my life. Jesus said to the disciples, this message of forgiveness is not to be kept in this room. This message is to go out to the whole world so that people can hear and be saved. How many of you heard the message of Jesus? Well, that should be everybody in the room. All right, because I'm giving it to you right now. All right. All right. So you've heard the message, and this is what Jesus intended for you to have was the message of his death, burial, and resurrection, and why he did it. Why did Jesus do it? He did it because I needed a savior. I couldn't get to heaven by myself. I need somebody, somebody who was perfect who, to die for me and then prove that they were perfect by rising again. Guess what? Jesus did that. Pretty awesome thing. It is good news. It is a great message what Jesus has done for us and other people need to hear what Jesus has done. So when you find something great, when you find something amazing, we want to pass it along. Like my mom, when she would get a, an amazing recipe, man, she'd be like, hey, everybody, this is an amazing recipe. You need this. Or um, if there's a new restaurant in town, you, how many like good food? I love good food, as you can plainly see. When I go to a new restaurant, I don't say, hey, don't tell anybody because... I just want this for me. No, we're like, hey, this new place over here, they've got the amazing T-bone steak or they've got the amazing chop suey or whatever. they got amazing liver and onions for all of you who like liver and onions. But, but whatever it is, we love to share the message. Uh, my wife and I, we lived uh, about a decade in, in Asia in a developing country and uh, not a lot of things were available uh, to us. There were some necessary things that we didn't always have access to. Some of um, were, were petrol or gas for our car, or sometimes we didn't have propane for cooking, and uh, other times we, uh, we didn't have Dr. Pepper or Hershey's bar, you know, the real important things. So whenever, we, whenever these things would come into the country, we, we would see them, and we'd call up our friends and say, Hey, Dr. Pepper is available at this store right here. You need to come and get it before it's all gone. 
And if we really like the person, we say, hey, can I pick you up some? Right? If we didn't like them, we say, hey, if they're here, they're here. You know? <laughs> Fend for yourself. But if they were there, we would, we would be super excited and we'd get on the telephone and say, hey, you got to get to Monadars because Monadars has Dr. Pepper. Now I can't, I can't vouch for how many I'm going to take. I don't know if I'm going to leave any, but you better get here soon. When something good happens, we want to pass it along. When something important, something amazing that we find, we want other people to know about it. Guess what? There's nothing greater than the message of Jesus. It is something worth passing along. No matter what people think about Jesus or think about, about his story, what he's done for our lives, it's hard to be, be quiet about, to be secret about. If Jesus has uh, saved us from our sins, it's hard to be quiet about that. If Jesus has saved our marriage, it's hard to be quiet about that. If Jesus has saved us from drugs or alcohol or overeating or whatever it is, it's hard to be quiet about it because Jesus is good news. Jesus is great news. Friends, I'm just so excited because there is nobody like Jesus. There's nobody who heals like Jesus. There's nobody who feels the need in our hearts like Jesus. Jesus is amazing, and we need to pass it along. Jesus had a disciple named Andrew. Andrew had an amazing knack for bringing people to Jesus he was so good at it, history nicknamed him Andrew the Bringer. He just would bring people to Jesus. It was awesome. And uh, Andrew had an experience with Jesus. So before you can give something, what do you have to do? You have to receive it. You have to have it before you can give it. If you don't have it before you give it, that's called stealing. Don't do that. You have to have it before you give it. So if you want to give hope, you have to have hope before you give it. You have to have an encounter with hope. You have to have a healing from hope before you can give hope. Friends, I want to just personally tell you that I have found personal hope in Jesus Christ. He has changed my world around. I am not the same person. I would not be the same person without Jesus. Jesus gives hope. So before you give hope, you have to receive hope, and then you become somebody who has hope. The, the hopeful one, if you're taking notes, has encountered Jesus. The hopeful one has encountered Jesus. John one thirty five says, the next day, again, John was standing, John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Verse 40 says, One of the two that heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. This is a just simple but powerful truth. The hopeful one has encountered Jesus, has in a moment of time responded and said, Jesus, you're the one I need. Everybody who's a follower, follower of Jesus has to pick a moment in time and say, right now, from now on, I submit to you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you want me to do. And it is an amazing thing. I remember my first encounter with Jesus. It was amazing. I had heard the stories of Jesus, about Jesus. I went to church. I sang songs about Jesus. But when I encountered Jesus, there was nothing like it. You can know about Jesus, but to encounter him is a whole nother level. When you say, Man, I know who he is. I've encountered him. How many of you, how many Christians here today remember when you first encountered Jesus? How many before, how many remember before, what life was like before? And then you encountered Jesus and 
there is nothing like having encountered Jesus. What's it like? Well, it's after encountering Jesus, you feel loved. Like you've never felt loved before. When you encounter Jesus, it's like hope and purpose floods your existence. Before you knew Jesus, you didn't really know why you were here or what your purpose was. But when you encounter Jesus, hope and purpose floods your existence. I don't know if you remember that rush, but I remember that rush when I came to Jesus and encountered him. That rush of purpose that came over my heart. That flood of hope. That flood of I am no longer under condemnation. I am free in Jesus. I don't know if you remember that uh, for you, but for me, it was a very real experience when I encountered, encountered Jesus. Jesus changes our existence from an a existence of despair to an existence of hope. He changes our existence. The second thing here under uh, Andrew is after the hopeful one has encountered Jesus, something the, the hopeful one does is he helps others encounter Jesus. If you're taking notes, the hopeful one helps others encounter Jesus. As we look at the life of Andrew, Andrew didn't want to keep Jesus to himself. After he encountered Jesus, he immediately thought, I've got people that need to meet him. I've got family members that need to meet Jesus. So the hopeful one helps their family encounter Jesus. And John 141 says, Andrew first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he, Andrew, brought Peter, Simon Peter, to Jesus. When we experience something, the ones that we love the most, they're the first ones we think about. Hey, I need to take uh, my brother to the steakhouse because it's an amazing place. Hey, I need to I need to take my brother to this place because they just treat you so well. Hey, I need to introduce my brother to Jesus because there is hope. If, he, if my brother encounters Jesus like I've encountered Jesus, it is totally worth the, worth the, the hazing, the razzing he's going to give me when, when I say he needs to go there. I don't know if you have any, any of you have older siblings, but I've got an older brother and an older sister, and I've got my full of it, you know. Um, it's pretty an amazing thing. I, I wouldn't be the person I am without my older brother. I'd be about th- three inches taller, and I'd, I'd have... <laughs> Wouldn't have broken bones and no, I'm just I love you, Chad, if you're watching. Um, I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be the same person. I I'm I am better because of my family. And because of my because of that, I want my family to encounter hope. I want my family to encounter Jesus. And so this is what Andrew did. He brings his brother to Jesus. Now, his brother exceeds uh, um, Andrew in following Jesus. Peter becomes part of the inner circle, but he, Peter would have, we would have never known Peter had not Andrew brought him to Jesus. Peter needed somebody to bring him to Jesus. We all need somebody to bring us to Jesus. Now, sometimes the hardest people to tell about Jesus, to bring them to to Jesus are those we love the deepest because they know us better than they think we know ourselves. They say, well, how can you follow Jesus? I know what you did in 1985. You know, how can, how can you call yourself a Christian? I know what you said last week. How can you? And so sometimes the toughest people to bring to Christ is our family. But even though it's tough, it's worthwhile because we want our family to have an encounter with Jesus like we've encountered Jesus. Secondly, uh, Andrew brings those close to him, close in proximity to Jesus. So he, he got to 
his family that it brings to Jesus, and then those close to you. The, and so it says in John chapter 6, verse 8, it says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fishes, and he brings the little boy to Jesus. How many remember the, the Sunday school story of Jesus feeding the 5,000? Yep, there's a little boy who brings his lunch to Jesus. Well, that story would have never happened without Andrew because Andrew found the lunch. He found the, the guy with the resources. He found the little boy, and so he brought those around him to Jesus. He said Jesus, he wanted people around him to have access to Jesus. So um, close in proximity, people like your neighbor, your coworker, somebody at the store, a store clerk or cashier, those around you. Do you know that your um, gas attendant, people at the gas station, need Jesus? Right, Lindsay? Right, Lindsay? <laughs> people at the grocery store need Jesus. People that you work next to need Jesus. People all over this town need an encounter with Jesus. What would this town be like if people encountered Jesus and then acted like it? There's a lot of people, a lot of Christian people who, um, who have encountered Jesus but don't act like it. And that's the trouble. Once we've encountered Jesus, we got to act like we've encountered Jesus. Um, some of the, the worst day to be a, a waiter or a waitress at a restaurant for tips is Sunday. Because Christians aren't very good tippers. And we've got a waitress in the audience. I don't know why that is, but Christians are horrible tippers. <laughs> I wish that was true. <laughs> um, we, when we're out in the world, we have to represent. If you pray over your meal, make sure you've tipped twenty percent, at least. If you're not going to tip twenty percent, don't pray over your meal. If you don't want to, if you, I want you to represent Jesus. Jesus would give his waitress at least twenty percent, and all the waitresses said. Amen. All right. All right. This is not in my notes. I just got off on this. So <laughs> all the waitresses says, you're welcome. All right. And then the hopeful one helps other people encounter Jesus, people around the world. Verse, excuse me, John chapter 12, verse 20. It says, now among those who went up to worship for the feast were some Greeks. Some Greeks, they're not Jewish people. Some Greeks were there. So these came to Philip from Bethsaida in Galilee and said and asked him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. These Greeks wanted to see Jesus. Philip didn't know what to do. So Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew knew what to do. Andrew and Philip brought them to Jesus. They brought them to Jesus. People all around the world need to hear about Jesus. If our gospel only works in America, it's not the gospel. If our gospel works in every country and culture and language, then it's the gospel. Because it's not just limited to us. It, needs, it gives access to the whole world. Jesus is good for our family. Jesus is good for our neighbors, and Jesus is good for the people around the world. We need, we need people to encounter Jesus. We need to have an encounter with Jesus once we have hope. So what do you do with hope? What do you do with hope? 1 Peter 3.15 says, but in your hearts Honor Christ the Lord as holy or set apart, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope 
that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Sometimes people, when they want to tell people about Jesus, they want to cram Jesus down people's throats. This is not what we